Good afternoon. I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Tania Fernandez, and I'm in charge of marketing and communication at the Madrid campus. Welcome to the SEP MBA Masterclass, Risk and Return in Business. I would like to present our speaker for today, Professor Javier Sanchez Verdasco. Javier Sanchez Verdasco is an associate professor at ESCP Business School, as well as other top-notch business schools and universities in Spain and Latin America. Professor Sanchez holds a PhD in corporate finance from the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, as well as various certifications on valuation, finance, and analysis from renowned institutions such as the London School of Economics or NYU. Javier is also part of In Company, where he manages director working in financial training and consultancy. Thank you, Javier, for being today with us. It is a pleasure. Uh, well, before we begin, I wanted to add that instead of a regular masterclass where the professor describes his topics, um, we expect this to be a very interactive session. Uh, so we'll be inviting everyone to participate through Mentimeter. I don't know if you have used that tool or not. If you have not, um, I will advise to get, you know, a second device on, on the side. If you have your mobile phone or your iPad, just have it on the side. And we're uh, going to ask you at some point to go into menti.com. Um, when you get into the URL, you're going to be asked to put a code there. Um, once Professor uh, Sanchez starts uh, his presentation, you're going to see a screenshot there, a slide, where you're going to see actually the, the URL for menti.com and the code that you have to enter. Once you enter that code, you're going to be able to see the pools that, that he's going to throw out you and you can answer everything. So, well, it's going to be really easy. So don't worry. It's going to be lots of fun. So uh, just be attentive and make the most out of this session. As for the Q&A, um, please post all of your questions in the question window and Professor Sanchez will be happy to answer them at the end of the webinar. As I said, we encourage you to participate so that you get the most out of this experience. So thank you all and enjoy your masterclass. Gracias, Javier. Hi, how are you? Thank you for your presentation, Tania. How are you all? Uh, uh, we are going to have a session in which we are really um, going to share some uh, financial knowledge specifically in one uh, particular item which is very relevant which is uh, risk and return right so if we don't want we don't want to want to run any risk we are going to invest our money in a german government bond in euros because it's the one that we call risk-free rate because we expect that um that the german government bond is not going to to fail right uh, unfortunately, Spanish government bond, it is not risk-free, it's very safe, but it's not. Greek government bond, it is not, and then uh, so on. So we, we, we talk about risk-free rates, a triple A comp a triple A country, developed country with a liquid market. Um, you know that in Europe, for instance, we have only two countries, triple A, apart from Luxembourg, but we have uh, Germany and the Netherlands, right? Uh, the rest of them, they have to pay a little spread over the German government bond because, you know, the market perceives that uh, uh, those countries have a risk, not, not, not a very high risk, but they have a risk, right? So uh, I'm going to share with you uh, some, um, and I want to have your opinion about uh, several aspects related with the risk and return in business. Okay, so let me... Let me share my screen. Okay, and go to uh, the Mentimeter. Uh, okay, the Mentimeter. Um, uh, okay, this is Serene. Yeah, you. Ah, now you're sharing now. You're seeing the, 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 that one. And then uh, uh, I have here a question for you, which is. A German government bond pays 2%. Now, they, they pay negative, right? But they, let's assume that they pay a 2%. Uh, and my question is, which expected return would you ask to invest in Germany's stock exchange in a diversified portfolio? I mean, just a little bit of banks, a little bit of automobile companies, a little bit of retail companies, uh, power companies. So that just a mix. Okay, thank you very much for your first opinion. We have one person voting 5%. Right.
I don't know, uh, Tania, how many participants we are here today now? At the moment, we have over 12 assistants. Okay, connected. 12. Okay, <laughs> just to see, um, just to see who's voting. You understand my question, right? So instead of investing your savings in a German government bond, just you, you decide to uh, probably to put some, a part of your money in the German stock exchange, in German stock exchange. And then for that, uh, you will probably require a different return, right? Maybe you require 2%, you can, but maybe you require more expected return. Again, I give you some more time until we have more participants, more votes. Okay, come on, I encourage you to, uh, to vote or maybe you don't have your devices prepared you perhaps can open another uh, screen in your computers. It's menti.com and then put the code 87099341 that you have over here. Well, I give them one minute more. Very good, thank you very much. One participant said that 8%. Okay, let's analyze what we have here, right? Uh, one person says that uh, if a German government bond pays you uh, 2%, he or she will require 4%. That means that he will require a 2% more, okay? The one who vote, uh, two persons uh, vote 5%. The equity market risk premium, which is what we call that in finance, uh, it is gonna be uh, 5%, all right? So, uh, sorry, the equity market risk premium is gonna be 3%, two plus three, right? So. Uh, they will require extra 3%, right? More, just th those that vote 8%, uh, those uh, participant as well, you know, what they think is that if a German government won't pay you 2%, they claim for a extra 6%, right? Extra 6%. And those that vote 10%, they require for an extra 8%, right? The issue that we have different opinions, right? But at the end, what we are doing is to put a number, a figure for our perception of risk, right? Those that, uh, you know, ask for, uh, the person that asks for 4% uh, is saying that, I mean, just pay me a little bit more, just is fine, because I like, uh, I, I like the stock exchange. And then um, also, um, um, you know, I, I don't have, uh, um, um, I'm, I'm just uh, against a, a, a person who wants the, the risk in a way. 2% is not that much. Those that vote, uh, on the contrary, uh, just uh, uh, 10%, that is they are requiring for an 8% more. Just that's what we call the equity market risk premium. So we have different opinions. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, what is the average. There are several ways that we explain in the corporate finance course in the MBA in ESCP that we explain how to calculate or how investors determine the equity market risk premium in a different way than we are doing now. That is just a survey, it's just an opinion, right? And I will tell you that uh, the equity market risk premium, it's a round of in triple A very safe countries like Germany in euros or uh, uh, United States in dollars is, uh, is 5%. It's the one I use, right? Currently now it's around, the market is giving uh, equity market risk premium of 4.2, which is more optimistic. But at the end, we are going to go, to go around, around this 5% for a, for a very safe country. Okay, good. Uh, 
let me go to another uh, to another um, um, to another survey that I want you to uh, to answer, which is uh, now, right? Same survey. You are not here anymore. In uh, you are not going to invest anymore in Germany. You are going to invest in Venezuela. But I still give you the reference of the two percent because you are in Europe. So your alternative uh, is not investing in dollars. Why? Because if you invest in dollars, you are having a foreign exchange risk. The only way, though, not having any risk is to invest uh, in a German government bond if you consider that the the uh, issues of I mean, the bonds. Uh, that issue the German government are very safe and they're going to pay back you money. All right. So then it's two percent, and then you know the code is here four seven three three eight three three three, right? And then um, uh, I'm asking you please to to vote here. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure if you are. See my screen. Uh, yeah, I think we're here. I, I was actually trying to go into the question, and I'm getting a notice. I don't know if the uh, if the other participants are having the same problem, see, right. but it it says that uh, no active question for this presentation. Ah, when okay. You actually put so that code. Let me let me uh, let me try to. I don't know what's happening here. Let me try to perhaps to uh okay cancel uh probably the uh it is uh well just what i'm gonna do is to close that and open again right perfect and then uh probably we get you know okay okay here Then I'm going to open this one. Hopefully, you can see this one now, right? Uh, my presentations, and then this one. Okay, do you see now my screen or not? Present now. Yes, let's see. I'm going to try it again. Um, Perfect. 47338333. Now, it's working perfectly. Guys, you can try it right now. Thank you, Tanya. Okay. 15%, 21%, 11%. I don't know why you are asking more than in Germany. I don't know why. Why? 21, 15, 11. This means that if you ask for 15, your equity market risk premium is 13. You know why? Because it's 2% plus 13. Here is 21, means that you are asking for 11% more, right? More than the 2%, 2% plus 11%. Let's give some chance to the rest of the participants to include their opinions. One percent, who said one percent? You are a Venezuelan person, perhaps, right? A German government bond is paying you 2% and you are happy with obtaining 1% or is a mistake? All right. I'm giving the chance to change uh, to, to that person that vote 1% is below. You are uh, taking a high risk because Venezuela is a is a risk, uh, high risk profile, and then um, uh, you are uh, asking for less than a, a, a absolutely 
uh, risk-free investment, right? So probably this you know, solution would be out of the market, right? Then yeah, you can think that is seven, which is five more, this is uh, seven more, this is uh, nine more, okay? So now currently the, the answer would be around 26%, right? Because the market now currently is the average of the market is given to Venezuela an equity market risk premium of 24. And if the uh, uh, German government bond pays you 2%, 2% plus 24 is 26%. Okay, this is the concept of the equity market risk premium. Depends on the market you invest and depends on the risk that market has, you will ask for a higher return to your investment. Remember, risk and return. The higher the risk, the higher the required return. Okay? All right, so uh, let me go with the third one. Uh, um, gonna go back. And then um, uh, I'm going to go to here. And then open this one. And then uh, present, All right? Daniel, do you see you are investing in stocks for which industry? Do yes, you see the I one? can see it perfectly. Let me just try it out. Thank you. Works non perfectly. Non-cyclical are business like uh, uh, like uh, milk, right? Cyclical are business like automobile, for instance, or real estate. Cyclical means that if the economy, uh, non-cyclical means that if the economy goes good or bad, I mean, you're going to consume the same milk all the time. So the, uh, mm, the cash flows of the business in a milk company just are easy to predict, are easy to forecast in a way, right? Uh, however, in a, a automobile company, an automobile company, what is happening is that you have a type of business in which uh, you will have, uh, you know, when the economy goes good, everyone is going to buy a car. When the economy is going bad, no one changes the car. Okay, so this is the cyclical and non-cyclical. Okay, now we are in the same market. Let's say Spain or Germany or France or Italy or Venezuela. Now, within the same market, we have different type of investments, right? Okay. I'm trying to guess which type of business is riskier than the average of the market or less risky. Okay, excellent, right? Uh, the, answer is, the answer is cyclical business with high debt. Excellent answers, right? Most of you just agree uh, on that, right? Uh, cyclical business with low debt is less risky. Why? For a stock exchange investor, a company with high debt is uh, riskier than with a company with low debt. Obviously, for a bank, in a bank, if a bank is lending you money, the bank is going to increase the interest rate they apply you. Uh, if uh, you increase your debt, because if you increase your debt, you are the probability of default is going to be higher, right? So they are going to charge you more interest. Instead of five, they're going to charge you seven, eight, twelve, right? A triple A company, right? A very good company is going to pay low margin. Uh, uh, just triple C company, which is a bad company from the rating perspective, you know that the rating is given by Moody's, Standard & Poor's and & Fitch, they, if they give you a low rating, then uh, you will have to pay a lot, right? So definitely, we have two parameters that we are assessing now. One of them, in the market you invest, right? And second, the type of uh, uh, asset uh, you buy, right? And then cyclical is obvious, right? Because uh, a cyclical company, the cash flows are uh, more difficult to be predicted, okay? And the debt is very important because uh, when uh, you obtain the free cash flow 
right, from the business, free cash flow is basic, basically the money that you are making, uh, say, minus uh, expenses like personal expenses, electricity expenses, uh, raw materials payments, and so on. And then you pay taxes, and then you allocate some money for investments, right? That you need to just uh, to run the company. Therefore, the free cash flow, it's at the end, the available money to be distributed uh, among the investors, right? Which is the investor, you have two type of investors, equity or shareholders, right? And banks or debt holders in general, because it could be both. All right, so good. So the answer is good. So we are just approaching to the uh, intuitive concept of uh, uh, of uh, risk and return, right? Let me go back. I have still two more questions for you, I think. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, no, just three. I have the last one. Right. Uh, I'm going to present over here. And the last question is that, that we are not talking about one single uh, investment. We are talking about a portfolio. Just in that case, I'm proposing you uh, which do you think, what, which portfolio you think has less risk, right? Because when you diversify, your risk decrease, right? And then I'm talking about one portfolio composed by Credit Lyonnais, Lyonnais and Société Générale, French banks both remember that they're both uh, both two banks the second alternative is walmart it is the, the supermarket company united states mainly though they have interest also in uh, in south america but it's united states mainly marriott hotels it's a hotel international but mainly located in united states anti intercontinental also mainly based in united states right Okay, then we have Mario Hotels, which is an American United States company, and Gafu, which is a French supermarket. And the last one is a hotel in United States, a supermarket in, uh, in France, and an automobile company in Korea. Okay? All right, excellent answer. Again, most of you said, you know, I prefer to have a Marriott Hotel, a hotel in the United States, supermarket in France, and automobile company in uh, Korea, because they have nothing to do. I mean, they have a relationship because all the markets are related, but in a way, uh, they have a different type of business, and probably uh, the uh, results of the company are not going to go in the same way. I should expect that, you know, the performance of a bank in France and the performance of another bank in France might be the same or probably similar. Well, different, but similar, right? However, if I, in a different market with different industries, I, I get the highest degree of uncorrelation, right? So low correlated company. When we talk about portfolio management, uh, it's important to know that if, for instance, if you like uh, football, right, uh, and you uh, you um, just join, uh, you just you are going to have a, um, and you know a dummy match, an imaginary match in which you are going to have eleven players like like Messi, Messi, the player of Argentina that plays in Barcelona football club now, right now. You you take eleven very good. Uh, 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 football uh, players uh, in the same team, but all equal, like Messi, right? And then you make a, a, a um, you make a match. You have a match against a second division team in Spain, for instance, right? Probably the, the second division team uh, is going to to win uh, to the uh, imaginary uh, um, uh, team made from eleven players, very good, but doing the same. Uh, because, for instance, the goalkeeper, just imagine uh, um, uh, Messi as a goalkeeper is not going to do anything. So in, the, in that case, the second division um, uh, team maybe 
have you know not so good players but diversified okay and they don't, they don't have they combine very well so the secret in portfolio management is going to be choose the the, the, the better uh players but also low correlator right so this is one of the keys of the risk right in in a, in analysis done now let me give you a little bit of theory right related with that that is what we explain in the corporate finance master obviously uh, just going in in, in detail uh, 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 to the to the um, to the aspects that are calculated so now I'm going to share with you my uh, my slides right okay and then very briefly because after all what I want is you make me all the questions you might have all right so this is a typical uh, uh, you know typical chart in which we have risk and return right we have the risk the return over here annual return and the risk and we will see how to measure that right so this is our typical this is in fact uh, you know real um a real uh, performance of uh, a stock indexes right and then obviously the investor wants to go this way all the time he wants to get a lot of return would you like to have an investment with 40 percent return and zero risk i'm sure you will but it is not possible in the real life right so then you you will try to find you know investments that go this way not this other way so again uh, increase the return decreasing the uh, risk okay now how is the risk measure for a single asset okay we have uh, two statistics uh, uh, tools one of them is the standard deviation right which is the square root of the variance that basically measures you the distance sorry basically me measures the distance of these points uh, regarding the average right this is the average five percent right and this is the distance right so you sum sum all the distance uh, of the points the just the return that we have in one week in another week or another week next week or month and then you sum all of them oh you sum all of them you will get zero that's why this is square right and then you divide it by the number of of of, uh, of points uh, to get an average right and then uh, this is square and it's called variance but then we normally use the standard deviation right because it's the uh, root square of that so i square then i i i calculate the root square i square because if not this is zero right and then this is a very 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 used uh uh tool in finance to calculate the risk you see here that this blue asset is riskier than the red one right so uh just uh uh educated uh, and just uh, knowledgeable uh, um, uh, investor will prefer this same return lower risk right right this is higher risk so he will pre he or she will prefer this one and then how to measure that this way okay standard deviation is telling me the movements you know the spread the oscillation of the asset return regarding the average we have another one very used which is now instead of knowing the uh the return regarding uh, so the the risk regarding myself my average i'm gonna do another thing which is calculate the uh, the risk i mean to compare the returns against my benchmark okay the benchmark for Marriott Hotels is the Southern Poor's, right? The benchmark for L'Oréal is the CAC, the French index. Uh, the the benchmark for Deutsche Bank is the is the, um, the DAX, the German uh, index, right? So then I take the returns of the index, I take the returns of the uh, of the asset, right, of the stock, and then I put in a graph, and I ask Excel to say, would, would you tell me? the uh you know the line that better fits right the uh the this cloud of points the, could you tell me what is the line that makes the difference between the points and the this uh line minimum right that is the all ordinary least square which is a methodology that is used uh, just is minimizing the square of the distance again to avoid that they 
they just uh, uh, compensate one with the other, right? So here we have Marriott. It means that the return of Marriott is equal to almost nothing plus 1.27 times the return of the American index, North American index, United States index, right? Okay, so then it's 127. Then, is this telling me that Marriott is riskier or less risky than the US market? What do you think? Think about that. Riskier, right? Okay, when the market moves 1%, Marriott moves up 127. But if it goes down, move 127 uh, down, right? So you see also that Intercontinental and Hyatt that are also United States hotels should have a similar relationship with the market. So also Intercontinental and Hyatt, they have a higher beta, right? This is what we call the beta. The beta measures the relative risk of an asset regarding its index or benchmark, right? So absolutely just uh, you know, related to the real life. A hotel is riskier than the market because when life goes, you, you find when the, the cycle, the economy goes well, you know, everyone goes for vacations, right? And also executives are traveling uh, abroad to, uh, you know, make business. So then just uh, the hotels are going to have high revenues. Con uh, contrary, contrary uh, on, on, uh, on the contrary, if the uh, economy goes down, no one is going to go to the hotels. So it's not like milk. You drink almost the same milk. It knows it's not like Coca-Cola, right? It's just you all go and drink the same Coca-Cola. Uh, it's not like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, um, just uh, bread, right? For instance, it's not going to have anything to do with that. So there are cyclical companies and less cyclical companies. So uh, for instance, the, the use of your mobile phone is less than the average. I mean, it's not going to move more than because you are going to use your mobile uh, where the, or the electricity of your house, of your home, right? Okay, so then we have the beta, which is higher or lower, okay? In that case. Correlation, this is very important, right? Just we work with an asset, we are with more. Just can be demonstrated, right? That when you add one and two and three, you're adding more number of assets to your portfolio, you get uh, just a figure like this right okay you are decreasing the risk when you are diversifying so if instead of one asset you have two you have five you have ten you have twenty you're going to reduce the risk of your portfolio right okay throughout the diversification that's true that when you uh, uh, put one asset when you go from two to three the reduction of risk is high when you have from 50 to 51 the reduction, reduction of risk is almost uh, negligible, right? And then you will see that there is a risk, which we call market risk, that cannot be diversified, cannot be eliminated. In other words, you have a portfolio uh, made by 500 uh, uh, shares, stocks. If the stock exchange goes down, you lose money. But, you know, the risk of losing money is less if you have a lot of stocks than if you have one single one, all right? Question, right? What should be the shape of the curve if your portfolio is formed by Crédit Lyonnais, Crédit Agricole, and Société Générale? What do you think? This is the shape of, you know, a diversified portfolio. For instance, Marriott Hotels, Cafu, and uh, Walmart, right? But what if you have three, three uh, uh, banks, all of them in France? What you will get would be, you know, this one almost just a horizontal line no diversification you know why because they are almost perfectly correlated the correlation coefficient of these three assets is not exactly one but it's very close to one might be 0 0.95 right 95 percent 98 percent you know why because they are all banks and they are all in france right okay so then here the trick is to put more assets but you know not correlated among them. All right. That was the example I was putting with the uh, with the um, with the football team. All right. Okay. Good. Well, this is the mathematical expression of correlationship. 
is going to be between, between minus one and one. One is perfectly correlated. Zero is not correlated. Minus one is perfectly correlated, but go, uh, you know, the, just on the contrary. Uh, when one is uh, going up, the other one is going down uh, with the same proportion. Okay. Now I'm finishing my all my theory, the theory I'm giving to you, uh, I'm teaching you today, uh, uh, so as to start a debate and uh, answer your question, right? Well, obviously, right? Uh, this is a webinar, and I'm showing you a general, uh, a general idea of uh, risk and return. But you also need to teach some theory, right? Apply to practice all the time, right? So in my students learn uh, obviously the theory of the chapter of the books. But you know, as being a professional, I am a professional of the analysis. I'm explaining them how things are done in practice, but in, with a base, with good base of theory, right? So the return, risk and return on an asset, it's called the capital asset pricing model, right? And the capital asset pricing model says to you something that we were doing in our survey, right? In our pool, we said, you know, the expected return that I'm going to ask is going to be the German government bond right, the 2% in our example, plus the equity market risk premium, right, so when you said 10, means that this is 2, and so this is 10, right, and this is 2, so this is going to be A, right, if you said 10, if you vote 10, you were saying that 10 minus 2%, which is the risk-free rate, is the equity market risk premium, therefore, 2 plus uh, 8 is 10, if in a very well, well, very well diversified uh, portfolio, right? But uh, maybe uh, you don't have a portfolio that is diversified when the beta is one. You're going to have one stock, for instance, right? One stock, like let's say, uh, you know, Volkswagen. Volkswagen is going to have a beta higher than one because it's in the automobile sector, and they have betas higher than one. Let's say that uh, uh, Volkswagen has a beta of 1.3 right and this is uh let's say in germany the mine one is five so 1.3 plus uh times five is going to be uh 7.5 and then if the risk-free rate is paying me two percent it's paying less now it's negative but then it's uh 1.3 times five is uh you know you know it's 6.5 plus two percent 8.5 all right so if I expect to have a return of 8.5 in the stocks of uh, Volkswagen, I will run the risk. If you, the expected uh, increase in uh, Volkswagen uh, price is going to be 2%, it's expected, it's not sure. So therefore, I'm running the risk, so it's not paying me enough, the 2%, it's not paying me enough, the risk I'm having. Remember that we are going to have required return Adjusted, adjusted to risk. Okay, okay. So the higher the risk, you know, the risk is here. The beta is measuring the risk, right? Okay. The higher is going to be the return. Okay. This is called the security market line, right? And if this goes up, this is the uh, coefficient of the x or the beta in this case is measuring the slope of the of the line. And then if uh, one person, you know. This is, uh, for instance, in Germany, and this is going to be in, uh, in Venezuela, right? Because the equity market risk premium is going to be higher. So that is telling you, uh, and in fact, that's the way that analysts calculate what is the expected return, the required return to make the valuations of the company. My required return in that case was, uh, we said, 8.5%. Okay? And now, about to... To, to to the end, right? Okay. One important thing is that we were talking about one asset, and also we said about the correlation ship, the correlation in the in the in the stock in the, of our portfolio. And then here you have uh, this is a, an exercise we do in class, in which uh, I ask the students to uh, calculate the different possibilities of combinations of our portfolio, right? So here you don't see that, but those portfolios are, are combined 20%, 40%, 20%, uh, or 50, 50, 0, or 25, 25, 50, or what's on. So 
these points are different combinations, different proportions of that. But the important thing here to know is that in that case, the, the first chart, I combine only three assets. I combine Spanish equity, foreign equity, and bonds, right? Here you have the expected returns, right? And then you have the standard deviation, right? Okay, foreign equity uh, standard deviation normally could be lower, you know, because they are more, that is high, has a higher diversification. The bonds are still risky, but not so much. It's fixed income. Uh, REITs is, is um, uh, it's uh, real estate uh, funds, right? Real estate funds and commodities. It's just a box of uh, just uh, wheat, gold, cotton, whatever, right? It's a just diversified portfolio investing in commodities, right? And then you have the expected return, the standard deviation, and the correlationship. Correct. For instance, one of the things here that you see is that the commodities, you know correlation with Spanish equity, right? Commodities and Spanish equity is almost zero and with foreign equity almost zero. So commodities has no correlation with the rest. However, the correlation of foreign equity with the Spanish equity, I mean, is not what? It's not zero, it's 0 0.62, which is slow, but you know, it still has a correlation. Obviously, bonds have to do with the market, yes, but only 25%, right? So just doing the maths that we uh, that we study uh, uh, in the, in the, in the course so that we are capable to uh, know which are the different uh, uh, combination of portfolio, right? This is only three assets. Then we say, well, we are going to add uh, uh, just real estate here, and you see that the red points are those of the combination of four. The blue ones are exactly the same that you have here. And then I add uh, new combinations with another asset, another class of asset, which is uh, real estate, right? And then it's going to be uh, the rates. And at the end, what I do is to add another class of asset, even low correlated with the rest of the four, right? Which is the green one. The green one is when I add commodities, just five classes of assets. And I demonstrate, right, that uh, here, well, uh, that I, I demonstrate here that uh, you know uh, when I uh, choose more assets and low correlated, you know the relation between risk and return is better. So you see that here the green points are almost uh, the, 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 the best, right? Uh, let me do something here, right? To try to, to uh, um, insert, uh, um, okay. Okay, and you see here that this is like, okay, no, not this one. Um, I'm gonna do this, right? And then you see here that more or less what I get is this, right? So, you know, for instance, this blue point that is below this green point is inefficient. You know why? Because, you know, I have in the same risk for the blue and for the green, but the green has a higher return. So I will never choose this one, okay? This is what, like, I choose that randomly, right? And a portfolio manager, what it's gonna do is not to do it randomly, but to do it scientifically in a way that he is not going to choose this when he has the chance to get this one. So to choose the portfolio, okay? For instance, this point and this point are efficient, both. The difference is that this investor, right, wants, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, comfortable with a 9% uh, return with a 9% standard deviation or, uh, or uh, risk. This one wants to have 15, right, percent return, but is willing to run higher risk because the risks are, this is a more, it is a less averse uh, uh, investor, and this is a risk averse. So he, he, I mean, he prefers to have less return, but with le low, a lower risk than this other one, okay? And, uh, you know, the end here, uh, so let me uh, share you that. Uh, the one I said to you, well, how we choose a single asset is through the capital asset pricing model, all right, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the one I showed you before is having to do with the theoretical model that is called 
the efficient frontier, frontier of Markovich that we have in the theory, that you see that all these are in efficient portfolio, and this is the efficient frontier of uh, Markovich. You know, that in, uh, in practice is calculated uh, this way, that we did in the exercise. Okay? Nothing else to say to you, right? So I hope that uh, presentation of this introduction uh, allows us to, Tanya, to uh, start with the, with the turn of question. Do you have any? I'm going to stop sharing, uh, right? Okay. I'm back. Hi, how are you? I'm Hola. sorry. Hola. A ver. Guys, um, remember you can start writing all of your questions on the question box. For the moment, we'll start with a first general question. Um, a ver. You have been mainly talking about the risk of an investment in shares. What what other financial risk do we run in a business? Okay, 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 okay. Good question. Good question. Okay. A stock, I said, well, the price of the stock goes up and down, the volatility of the stock. It means that we have another risk. For instance, we have interest rate risk. Okay. Think about a company that is borrowing money from a bank. And the, uh, the rate that they, the company pays is... LIBOR plus 1%. LIBOR plus 1% means that, you know, the LIBOR is the interest in the market. Every year is going to change. LIBOR one year is the interbank uh, rate that is going to be paid among banks, right? And then uh, uh, this uh, LIBOR plus 1 is going to change next year. The LIBOR now could be at the lower level, but next year could be at 5%. So if LIBOR is 2% plus 1, you pay 3. But then in LIBOR, goes to five, you're gonna pay five plus one. So normally when you borrow money from banks, they give you a floating rate, a reference rate, and it's gonna change every year, okay? So if the rate of interest goes up because the economy is recovering and then the central banks are going to rise in interest rates, then uh, the financial expense of a company will be higher. How to solve that? We have instruments, interest rate swap, we have derivatives, futures and options that we also study in the master uh, in the corporate uh, finance course to uh, teach, you know, future managers, right, to uh, manage the interest rate risk of a company. Okay, but I didn't finish, right, uh, Tanya, that is another, another one, which is the exchange, foreign exchange risk. Okay, <laughs> what if you are exporting uh, you are a European uh, a company in euros. You, I mean, your income statement is in euros, right? And you are exporting to USA, okay? You're going to receive the payments in dollars, mm -hmm. okay? And you need to come back and change the dollars against euros because you pay in euros, your life is in euros, right? And maybe the conversion rate, the exchange rate is gonna be different uh, regarding the one you had when you were doing your budget, right? Okay, and there is a depreciation of the dollar against the euro, so you're going to receive uh, less euros, right? Because the dollar worth less. There is another way also to uh, hedge that risk, which is with futures and options on foreign exchange currencies, right? But there is another risk. We said interest rate risk, we said also the uh, uh, foreign exchange risk, okay? Uh, we have the commodity risk, right? A company that is buying cotton to produce jeans, right? The, the price of the cotton is uh, fixed in the international markets, in the future markets, in the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And if the price of the cotton goes up, your raw materials are expensive, you cannot translate that to the price of the jeans, and then you lose money because your raw materials are increasing in the markets, right? Okay, so then there is another way to get to that, buying your cotton in the future markets with a future option. Fix a price for the future. Can be done. In finance, we do very, very smart things. Uh, one of them is that just to fix the price, right? It's an agreement that, uh, you know, financial institutions give to you. And then the last one could be uh, the uh, country risk, right? 
you know you have a kind of cross-border risk for instance you have a subsidiary in uh, argentina right and there is a change in the government and they say no you cannot uh, you know you cannot uh, bring back your dividends right you cannot receive your dividends because there is a law that uh, avoids the uh, the you know the 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 money uh, the money uh, cross border uh, you know uh, uh, change right you cannot uh, there is uh, capital restrictions uh, for your money right or you have another country is or could be i mean a war somewhere right a conflict right this is countries that's all the risk that we have in addition to that right but we know how to hedge them right we have instruments too the first one the first instrument tanya is the analysis right you have to analyze where you're going to put your money obviously you're going to run risk if you don't want to invest your money only in a german government bond that pays you a little a little bit right you need to run risk if you don't want to run any risk don't run a company don't you don't have to do a startup you're better at home with your money in the bank right but if you want to run a risk maybe you're going to make more money but you have risk then what you have to do is to assess very well your risk just to try to run low, the lowest risk you is possible to have to have a higher return remember going from the left to up in the graph right increase the return lowering the risk okay answer my question yes good yeah i yeah i think it's perfect really interesting <laughs> and well we have another question remember guys if you still have questions you're still in time to put them on the question box um well and i have another question here they're asking, can an investment have a negative beta? Okay, uh, remember what a beta is, right? A beta is the relationship of an asset or a stock with the market. For instance, Marriott has a positive beta, says that. If the, uh, in, remember in the slides, right? If the uh, Standard & Poor's goes up by 1%, uh, Marriott is going to go up by 127%, all right? It's more than, right? Uh, just a mill company would have a beta lower than one, let's say 0 0.60. Therefore, that means that when the stock exchange, when the market, the average of the market, you know, goes uh, up for, to, by 1%, you know, the milk only 0 0.60%, all right? So risky companies are going to have a beta higher than one, uh, non-risky companies or less risky than the average are going to have a beta lower than one but you know which company could have a negative one which means when the stock chain goes up the company goes down or when the stock chain goes down the company goes up right they return the company a business that has a mine of gold you know is producing gold right yes you know why because when life is not so sure is no so good the markets are going down you know what's what what is doing the, the investors some of them buy gold right just to protect them right and then you know if the market goes down everyone is going to buy gold the price of the gold is going to go up and your company is going to make a lot of money i mean but i only find this real example normally betas are positive right normally but could be in that situation amazing well um if there are not any other questions i think we're gonna wrap it up okay we okay well uh thank you professor uh, jaime sanchez a pleasure, right to share you oh. with you this i hope that uh clarifies a bit the style of things that we study, this has been more open. Obviously, we go for more just uh, specific concepts, right? Uh, uh, but always what we try to do is to make the theoretical concepts, right? As formal, we need formal concepts, just close to the real life, right? To be applicable in your real life, in your real business, right? 
and uh, and that's what I try to to do today to show you how uh, how I teach right in uh, in the school. Yeah, that that was. A bit. I think that's the idea behind this to actually for you guys to see what is the approach our professors give to, to, to their courses at ESCP. Uh, we actually have a, a comment from Maria Agassi who says that excellent. Thanks a lot for the masterclass and thank you for the practical explanation. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think she wraps up perfectly what this masterclass was about. So we're Really thank you, Professor, for, for your time and for being Good here with us. And everyone, we're really happy to have you. Um, remember, you have a house at ESCP, and we hope to see you in further events and hopefully at our classrooms next year. So if, if you have any questions or want to contact us, do you know where we are? Thank you very much. I hope you have a really nice evening. Thank you, Javier. Muchísimas gracias.